this issue is very important to me. Um, I am a survivor of solitary confinement. Um, I did an aggregate amount of seven years in solitary confinement, and for any one individual stint, the longest time was two and one and a half years. Um, I stand before you as a testament to God that he is still working miracles and still so great because that experience there, I watched while I was going through it, I watched a lot of friends uh, lose their minds and some of them take their own lives. Um, encoded in our DNA is a social paradigm that says that in order for you to feel fully human, you have to interact with other human beings. Uh, what's really sad is like the SPCA, uh, they have a rule that animals of the same like who are kept together can get congregate time together during the day so that they remain healthy and happy, but we won't even do that for human beings. Um, I came in towards the end of the summer, but I noticed a racial justice uh, forum and one of the biggest problems about this issue is that it is disproportionately affecting people of color. Now, we're 13, 14% in the state of New York, but over 60% in prisons and jails, and higher than that in solitary confinement cells. So right now, what we're doing is we have a HALT bill, it stands for Humane Alternatives, to long-term isolated confinement. And what it would provide is a limited time that somebody can stay in solitary. As it stands right now, at this very moment, if a soldier in Afghanistan blew up an entire barracks of American soldiers, because of international laws and the Mandela rules, he could not face more than 15 consecutive days in solitary confinement. That's the UN General Council. That is the rule that all countries agreed upon, including the United States. However, in New York State, somebody can go into solitary confinement for weeks, months, years, and even decades. We have at least two people who have been there for three decades. Now, I, I don't know about you, and I know this doesn't directly impact you, but let me tell you, this is a real social issue. This is a public health concern, too. Because when somebody goes into solitary and they lose their mind, they send them back out into the community and they either work, live, or some way come in contact with you. Is that what you're paying your tax dollars for? To somebody to go in, get further damaged than they were when they, before they came in, and then send them back out here to live amongst everybody else. Now, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm about two jokers uh, lost on my own deck because of my stay in there. Uh, God granted me the ability to come out and advocate for this issue. And so I, I want you to know that this is about saving lives. It's, it's, it's under, indisputable that more than 15 days in solitary confinement, your body, your brain begins to change. You begin to lose your humanity. You heard the cries, the screams, the banging. Those are human beings. When we play these places, we usually don't tell them what it is, and we ask, and they say, oh, dolphins and animals. Because what happens when you cage somebody like that? You bring them to their basis, animalistic self. Now, far be it for me to say that solitary confinement should not be used. There are cases where people need to be separated from, from population separated, but never isolated. Let me give you an example. So, any Bills fans here? <laughs> Don't be ashamed. <laughs> 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 they like this shame. They did pretty good last year. The reason why I ask, because when the Bills play, well, a lot of correction officers are Bills fans, you know, they bet on the games and all of this. And uh, they get very angry when they lose. And you can go to solitary confinement because you were rooting for the other team. <coughs> or because you had too many postage stamps. See, they want you to believe that everybody who goes to solitary confinement is a threat to himself or somebody else. 65 to 72% of the people currently in isolated confinement right now do not meet that criteria. They didn't assault anybody. They didn't do anything that would, should get them to the level of being placed in isolated confinement. Yet they do it. 
it is really appalling that in this day and time that we continue to subject our citizens to this type of torture. And that's what it is, torture. Make no mistake about it. I submit to you that you go over to uh, Open Arms and go in that center. Go in there and sit for any appreciable amount of time if you can. I've been touring that cell all over Western New York, and I can tell you, people come out of there visibly shaking, crying. Some people refuse to go in. Because once you realize how harrowing experience that is, you, you can't imagine that we visit this daily upon the citizens of the state of New York. And we do it like it's all right. Right now, while you're sitting here, somebody is sitting in an isolated confinement cell contemplating suicide. Most of the suicides that happen in prison happen in isolated confinement. And please, don't let me get you, don't mistake it that this is a prison issue. This is a human rights issue, number one. And jails, you have a local uh, lockup here, the Monroe County Jail. Well, they have isolated confinement too. And let's say, I know none of you guys will end up in there, but let's say somebody you know does. Then they're subject to the possibility of spending as much time as whoever deems necessary in solitary confinement for any act that they want to deem necessary. So the bill that we're producing, and uh, it would change the paradigm for solitary confinement. So let me tell you what it would do. First, it would do the international limit. 15 days, no more than that. Now, if somebody is particularly incorrigible, then you have to do something about that, right? So what we've decided is that instead of keeping them in isolation, we would move them to what we call our RRU. And that is a residential rehabilitative unit. That means, Right now in solitary, you get one hour. One hour a day outside of yourself. One hour. So for 23 hours, you're locked in. And maybe if you got a shower one of those days, you'll get a little bit more time. But for the most part, 23 hours, you're locked in. In this case, seven hours you would have out of cell time. And it would be required for you to get therapy, take educational courses, and have meaningful interaction with both staff and other prisoners, or inmates, or county jail people, so that you do not lose your mind. The worst torture that you can do to a human being is to ostracize them or isolate them. I would, I'd rather you hate me than ostracize me, than, than lock me away, than, than co-sign me to Persona non grata status, which is what we have when you're in isolated confinement. So we will put them in the RRU, and there's rules for that. There's rules for who can go there, how long they can be there, what services they get. As it's, as it's presently constituted, you go in an isolated confinement cell, and <coughs> nobody deals with you. Nobody. They don't send a psychologist. They don't send a counselor. They don't send a teacher. Nobody. You sit in that cell. So seven out of the 10 guys that go to prison don't have a GED or high school diploma. So they're pretty much functionally illiterate. So what are you going to do all day in the cell? You can't read or write. I did a lot of reading and writing for my, for my peers at that time. One of the things that kept me sane was the ability to help other brothers out who I saw losing it because God somehow gave me the fortitude to, 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 to hang in there and not lose it myself. I can tell you I never contemplated suicide, but I definitely wanted to hurt somebody else because of the pain that was being visited, visited upon me. Hurt people invariably hurt other people. And this is what you have in this situation. So it, it's incumbent upon us as a community to say, not on my dime, not on my watch, are we going to continue to do this to human beings. When you get sentenced for a crime, I don't care what the crime is, how little or how horrendous, you're not sentenced to solitary confinement. You're sentenced to a general population with other people with opportunities for recreation, for education, for counseling, for, psycholo for psychological therapy. You have an opportunity for a lot of things that you can take advantage of. But the minute they place you in solitary confinement, none of that exists anymore. So my question is, what are we expecting to get out of people we put in there knowing what's going to happen to them? 
What are we expecting to get? So I'm, I'm saying that the system is not broken. The system is working the way they want it to work. Because you can't tell me that you know that this is happening to this person and what's going to be the result of that, and you do it to them anyway and say you're doing it for their best interest or the interest of any of you in society. They're not doing it for you. Because if they were looking out for you, they would make sure that every person that went inside an isolated confinement cell got help so that they could find out why they're in there, why they came to prison, and what they need to do to come back to society and be a law-abiding citizen. No, they don't provide that. So it would also exclude vulnerable classes of people. Right now, juveniles, 13 to 21, could go into isolated confinement. They already know, this is proven fact, that after four hours, a young person in isolated confinement begins to lose his grip on reality. Four hours. This is scientifically proven. I'm not making this up. Four hours it takes. When we give our kids time out for things that they're doing, and I'm sure you may have grandkids, we don't leave them there indefinitely. But this is what they do in the Department of Corrections and in the state of New York in this county jail. And this is what's got to stop. Because we're ruining people's lives and we're setting them up for failure, but we also creating a public safety risk for our community. They would tell you, the Department of Corrections said they need this as a management tool. I'm here to tell you that. Colorado, Nevada, uh, Vermont, uh, North Dakota, uh, California, all of these places have changed their solitary confinement rules in corporate and keeping in, co in conjunction with the HALT bill. And each facility says that their violence went down, that the interaction between staff and prisoners was better, and that they wish they had changed it soon. Everyone. One of the biggest gang problems in California they no longer, they took their cells from 1,500 men down to 18. Presently, the unit is closed for solitary confinement and is a minimum security unit with cells open all day for people who on that status could come and go. The Department of Corrections said that they, the guy spent tw 20 hours, he couldn't even do 24. The, the chief of the Department of Corrections in Colorado went inside his cell 20 hours, and when he came out, he said, no more. I will not do this to another human being. This is the Department of Corrections head person. We've been asking Governor Cuomo and anybody else to come and sit in that cell for five minutes, but they refuse to. Yet, they know what he's doing to people. And I don't want to um, smooth over this disproportionately uh, black and brown people in there. It's also disproportionately people with mental health issues in here. Because you know when they closed our mental health facilities, what they did, they just locked them up. They criminalized their mental health issues. So you got people going in there mentally ill, being placed in a situation that exacerbates their problem. For what? For what? This is torture, and we have to stop it. And I'm telling you, the people who are going through it are complaining. But it's until people like yourselves, who are, I would say, least affected. Uh, let, me, let me give you an analogy. So during slavery, right, you know slaves weren't happy with that, right? You can, you can imagine, right? So they were fighting for their freedom. But it wasn't until good white people said, I don't want to be party to this. I don't believe in this. And I'm going to fight side by side with them to end this, that we saw any change in this country. The same as it is with this issue. Until people like yourselves go to uh, Robach and Gant and pressure them to sign on as co-sponsors of this bill, until that happens, it won't, we won't get the law. So let me tell you where it's at right now. We have over 100 co-signers in the assembly. The Democrats have been wonderful on this issue. But as you can imagine, the Republicans have not. And uh, we need to push them to get on board.
Without them, uh, we are right now four Republicans short of having enough votes in the Senate to pass it. We have enough votes in the Assembly right now. But we're four short. And a couple of them reside in this area. And that's why I'm here today to reach out to you to say, when we go over to their office, if they don't see constituents, then they're not moved. Because I'm not going to vote for them from Buffalo. So they don't have to placate me in any way other than give me a meeting. But if I bring you with me, and you're saying I am a constituent, you know, and this means something to me, and if you don't help us out with this, I may not vote for you. I may find somebody else to vote for. I think in that case, we'll get more pressure on them and get an opportunity to get this passed this year before this session is over. Um, so I know you have questions. I know you have questions. And I just gave you a brief overview. And you said you wanted to wait until after the end of the presentation. So I want to highlight one or two other things. And I want to give you an opportunity. Because uh, I am going to try to leave here. I am, I am not feeling well at all. I am <clears throat> not good. I don't know. It just came down over me overnight. I mean, I got really ill yesterday. And uh, I'm not feeling good. So I don't want to. I don't want to infect everybody else. Why don't we just go ahead and, and do a few questions? Yeah, we can do a few questions. Because I don't, I don't want to tax you either. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I'm, I'm holding up, and I, I feel good. I, a couple of questions would help me. For sure. Yes, sir. Do you know if Steve Hawley, Assemblyman, has signed on to it? Steve Hawley. Okay. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that he had that name. Does not ring a bell to me. Most of them who have signed on, I know. Um, I don't believe so. Is he uh, your representative? He's a classmate of mine. Oh, he's a classmate. <laughs> that would be a lot of extra pressure. Night. That would be so. What what I would like to do is, anybody's interested in helping us out as far as going on the trips that we take. So when we come, I come over here regularly and I go meet with the legislators. And I would like to bring some of you who feel like this is an issue that you that means something to you and that you would be willing to advocate with me with your representatives, I would love to bring you to a meeting. And not, not only do we bring you there, we do do a training with you in advance. I don't know how many of you have ever met with them uh, personally, but there, you know, there are some skills. Because these are politicians, and they know what they're doing, and they play political games. So we try to get right to it with them, and, and there's ways that we can ex explain to you to show you how to be more effective in a presentation to them, and to let them know where you stand and who you are. Because that's very important to them, uh, that their constituents are somebody who feels something about this. Uh, not too long ago in Buffalo, Senator Tim Kennedy said to me that, oh, I, I, I agree with you, I, I think what you guys are doing is right, but what do my constituents feel? So I invited them to my church, and, and then I asked them to stand up. Who felt this? And it, we have a church of about 800. So it was about 600 there that day, and 500 people probably stood up. And he signed on the next day. The next day, he said, I'm in. So it's, it's a, the, abil the ability to do this is there. It's just that we have to put in the work. And you have to have a, a, a passion for it. I'm, I'm passionate about this because of my history. But I'm also passionate about this because I understand human nature. And what we're doing is we're, we're decimating people by making them inhuman and torturing them. You heard the sounds. I, that's... That was smuggled into a facility in Maine, a unit in Maine. I can tell you, I've been in units almost all over the states, and that's no different than any other place I've ever been. See, some people think, oh, solitary confinement. You have the uh, Department of Correction head, Mr. Anucci, make a comment that, oh, if they put me in solitary confinement, it'd be the best night sleep I ever got. But see, he never been in there to know that you're not going to get sleep because people yell and scream all night. They play chess, they bang for the correction officers. Some just scream because they want to feel alive. They want you to know that they're alive. So his idea that it's some nirvana place where you go in and you can, mm, and it'll be all right, is a far, far from the truth. It, it is something that once he went in, I can tell you, he would not get a good night's sleep. But this is when you don't know and you say stuff like that, that's ignorant. It's inconsiderate, 
And it's definitely wrong because he would not get a good night. The only way he ain't get a night's sleep is if his house is a jungle to begin with. Yeah, and he might be. I don't know, so it might be. I got kids running around, the face screaming, yelling, throwing stuff. If that's the case, then he may be used to it. But I submit to you that nobody is used to or even gets used to this. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm totally against solitary confinement. California straightened it out. Oprah Winfrey yes. was on that wonderful 60, 60 minutes piece. 60 I guess. minutes. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And I think everybody in this room is prepared to go see their, um, uh, you know, elected officers and talk to them. Is that right? Everybody yes. here yes. is ready to go? Yes. I think we should do it. Well, you, We've done it before. Four, we yeah. managed to pass, help pass the... Uh, Raise the age? Yes. yes. And yes. we can do it together. Let's just get the hell to work and do something about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so the young lady who I did introduce is my uh, is Markeisha Jackson. She is my associate over here, and she's the person that's going to be working, because I can't come over here every day. She's the person who I will be working through to work with you to go. She's already reached out to Gant, Robach, and everybody, and of course, they haven't gotten back to her. So to say that we have a group of your constituents who'd like to come and sit with you and discuss something that's important to them, We'll probably get a more traction than what we've been doing thus far. And we can just show up. And I would be glad to come over here any day that you guys want to go. And let me tell you this. Please understand, you don't have to wait for her or I. You don't. You have relationships with them. You know people. You can go and just drop the bug in their ear that, you know, this solitary thing is up. I don't like it. And you need to be on the right side of this. And then see what they say and see what they do. Because we have, what we're going to do is some rapid actions that for the people who are still saying, we're not going to do it, we don't care, we're going to make their life a little bit miserable. We're going to be chanting and marching and we're going to be in their offices. We're going, we are going to do some, nothing to get you locked up, no civil disobedience on that level, but to bring the media and to bring the community to bear that these are people who are supposed to be, listen, they work for you. You don't work for them. And unfortunately, too many people, because of this symbolic interaction we have, this is a psychological thing where you see somebody that's a, an elected official, a cop, or a uniformed person, you nev normally deflect to them and, and, and have some respect for them above and beyond maybe what they deserve. And in this case, that's what we're talking about. You don't have to defer to your legislators. They work for you. You are their employer. Just think of how your boss treats you sometimes. You can treat them because you are the boss. And if they do not respect you, then we can get them out of here. And I'm telling you, Republicans are very vulnerable right now because of the president and a whole bunch of other things that's been going on that I'm sure you're more than well aware of. They're in a vulnerable place. So right now, things that they would have never said yes to some of them are willing to say yes to now because they want to hold on to them seats. Not that their minds have changed or their hearts have changed, but they know the votes are going to change, and they're going to do that. So I'm going to ask Marquisha that if you can before we leave, or if Roberta would take the, uh, the task on of getting us the information. Now, I came and spoke before, and I don't know who was here the last time I spoke, and we had, um, I see you, and we had, um, we gave out some, uh, petitions where you signed on and people said they wanted more information. The people who wanted more information, have you been getting the emails and stuff? Yes, okay. That's all I wanted to work, make sure. Now, the, other, the only other thing, as I have five minutes, is I have with me today, for those of you who don't want to go on the cell or want to share this experience with other people, I have an opportunity for you to purchase a book. And it's called, Hell is a Very Small Place. Now, these are actual writings of prisoners in different states, some in New York, all over the country, who have been in solitary, and they're recounting their solitary experiences. So that you can know that, not what I say, not what anybody say, from the proverbial horse's mouth, what they feel about that experience and how it has changed their lives, some irrevocably. So uh, if you want to share this with somebody, 
uh, read it for yourself. I told you I didn't read all the way through. I'm about halfway through the one that I have. It could move you to tears. You will be angry. You will be disgusted that our country does what it does to people. You will feel empathy for people that you probably never thought that you would feel any empathy for. But you will learn a lot about human nature and what a terrible, torturous environment, isolated confinement is. Yes. Yes. Um, on a federal level, what happens with solitary confinement? Well, for every secure facility has some unit somewhere in that facility where they have isolated confinement. Mm -hmm. That is the paradigm in the state and in the, and in the fed, federal government too. That they have segregation units, they have isolation units, they have keep lock units. So it's no different. Uh, federal jails are run better than state jails, just because they have the resources to run better. Uh, but other than that, the isolated confinement is basically the same. But I've also read about, I think it's, uh, is it Pelican Bay? Pelican Bay, yes. Um, where really the worst of the worst care. And, and are they all in solitary confinement? Yes, Pel Pelican Bay is an entirely, it's a, yes. yes, it's entirely segregated. And they say the worst of the worst, but that's a subjective I opinion. Yeah. Who's the worst of the worst? Uh, you know, if, if you're in prison and you have to protect yourself and you hurt another person because you're protecting yourself, they'll put you in solitary. Are you the worst of the worst because somebody was trying to harm you? Really? Yeah. I mean, these are people like Ted Kaminsky. I mean, you know. Well, let, let me tell you something. Should we treat, you know, and, 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 I, and I know I only got a few minutes, but I want to make this Christian point here. As a Christian, we believe in forgiveness. So whatever anybody does, because we've all done something that we want forgiveness for. It may not rise to the occasion of a Ted Kaczynski, but in God's eyes, a sin is a sin. Don't we believe that? Don't you believe that? Don't you know that? So anything that you do that's sinful or illegal, you know better than the person who they consider the worst of the worst. And we should not be treating human beings. See, once you start to lose your humanity and treat others like that, then who, what do we become? And we have enough, enough instances in this country where people have gotten power and shown that when they can rule it and, and hurt you, they'll do that. And this is what solitary does. And I don't think we should do that to anybody. Anybody. If you want to maintain your humanity, you've got to remember to treat other people with humanity. 